Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to my YouTube channel on ADHD for another short commentary on what I think is an interesting question that keeps popping up in my news feed, uh, and that is, what is aphantasia, and is ADHD related to this? Before we get started, I do want to just apologize for my somewhat gravelly and nasal sound today. I've come down with a bit of a cold, so I've got my trusty mug of tea. And because it's a cool rainy day here in Richmond, I've gone back to flannel, just like a lot of old baby boomers usually do. So, all right, so let's ask this question. Is ADHD linked to aphantasia? Well, first of all, what is aphantasia? It is a significantly weak or even absent capacity for generating mental imagery, often referred to as mind blindness. Now, what do we know about aphantasia? It's an interesting subject, by the way. If you're interested, just use Google Scholar, enter aphantasia, and you'll see a variety of, I think, interesting papers on the subject. In these papers, you're going to find that aphantasia has been associated with a number of other difficulties. First of all, there is the diminished abilities to mentally generate other forms of private sensory events, such as reimagining smells, rehearing what people have said, re-experiencing certain feelings of touch, and other forms of sensation. So people have suggested that aphantasia may not be limited strictly to the visual domain, but may imply a difficulty with generating all sorts of private mental sensory events. That's an interesting possibility that some papers have indeed demonstrated. Second is that there's also a diminished sensitivity to the sensory events themselves, so that when a person with aphantasia sees an image outside of them, or maybe feels a touch or smells something, the sensory cortex associated with that sensation is not as active as it is in other people. This has been most often demonstrated in visual images, where when shown a visual image, there's less activation of the visual cortex. So no surprise, there would be less capacity for reactivating visual images in mind, which is, of course, we said what aphantasia was originally defined as. So that's kind of interesting, that maybe aphantasia is arising from diminished cortical excitability that is also related to this diminished sensitivity to sensations. So interesting possibility there. There's also lessened activation in a part of the brain known as the ocular motor cortex. Some people think of this as the sensory eye fields. It's up toward the frontal lobe, sometimes been referred to as the source of mirror neurons. This is what gets activated almost automatically when we see people performing an action. You may not know it, but when you watch someone do something, your brain is actually activating the same neural pattern as if you were doing that. This is where our capacity to imitate comes from. We're able to vicariously learn from others by watching them because our brains appear to almost automatically engage in a form of private imitation. And it's been found that people with aphantasia may not be able to do that. That is, when they see others or when they visualize an action themselves, such as while mentally simulating throwing a ball, for instance, we don't see as much activation of this ocular motor cortex during these activities. Some people have found that when people with aphantasia read a passage that's very emotional or hear someone else speak that, those words that involve that scene of high emotion, they don't experience as much emotion to those scenes because they can't activate the images as well that go with the words. See, when we hear the words, 
Most people activate an image. That image enhances the emotional experience from reading and listening. Some studies show that people with aphantasia aren't able to ob obtain that level of emotional reaction to things that are read or heard. However, the same studies show that if you show them pictures or even a movie that shows that scene, they have as much emotional reaction as other people. So it's not a flattening of the emotional response. It's an inability to activate images that would then enhance the emotional response. I hope you understand the distinction. There's also a reduced affective reaction to scenes that are described by others. So when they're listening to somebody talking about themselves and what they've gone through, they may not have as much emotional reaction, indeed may not show as much empathy, perhaps, to that description unless they are shown images or pictures of it. Otherwise, they don't get the generated image in their mind that other people would get. Another study found that people with aphantasia don't recall as many details of their past, known as episodic memory, probably because they struggle to activate images associated with their history and past events. So they can describe it, but it's not as detailed a description, and they often report weak or non-existent images of those past events. And then, perhaps related to that, they have difficulty generating images about future possibilities, simulating future possible actions. If so, if given a hypothetical situation and asked to think about what would you do in that situation, they of course don't have as much imagery about that future scenario and therefore have more difficulty simulating it and even activating images of their own actions in that future. Suggest that people with aphantasia also might have difficulty doing what a lot of athletes do, which is to practice their athletic movements, such as their golf swing or their diving, if they're involved in competitive diving or whatever they're doing. They may not be able to use mental simulation to benefit from mental practice the way other people are able to do. So you've learned a lot about aphantasia here in this presentation right there. Now let's move on to the question I asked at the beginning. Why might aphantasia be associated with ADHD? Well, let me first of all point out, there is not a single study that I could locate in the journals that has addressed this question. But why should we ask this question? Here's why. ADHD, as you know, is linked with difficulties with executive functioning. And one of the seven major executive functions is nonverbal working memory, which I've defined in my books, my 2012 theoretical book on executive functioning, as principally involving visual imagery and the larger domain of sensing to the self. People with ADHD have difficulties with nonverbal working memory. Now you can begin to see the link, can't you? Is this difficulty with nonverbal working memory the result of aphantasia? Or might aphantasia make it worse? So it's possible, therefore, that ADHD could be linked through this process to aphantasia. We just don't know. Another possibility, however, is that people with ADHD don't have a problem with visual imagery. They have a reduced capacity to use that imagery to guide behavior. We've talked about this before. ADHD is more of a performance disorder, not a knowledge disorder. So what you know is no different than other people, but people with ADHD struggle to use what they know. So is that what's happening here? People with ADHD can imagine scenarios, but those imaginings don't help to guide behavior toward goals and help them with their self-regulation. 
We just don't know. But this would lead me to urge any students out there in undergraduate or graduate programs, and they have to do a research project, maybe an honors thesis, a master's thesis, a dissertation. Here is a very good hypothesis that you might want to explore. There are good rating scales to assess aphantasia, which occurs in about 4% of the population. Indeed, about 1% of those have no capacity for visual imagery. The remaining 3% have a diminished or weakened capacity for it. So go out and find adults or even children with ADHD administer these questionnaires. You're also going to want to administer ratings of executive functioning as well as tests of nonverbal working memory. And let's see what these relationships turn out to be. This could be a very interesting and publishable research project. So if you know of somebody who's looking for a research project, here's one they might want to explore. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this little treatise on aphantasia and why I think there's a possibility that it might just be linked to ADHD. All right, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and I'll see you again on this channel with more videos on ADHD. Be well.